Hello, everyone. As it's right on um, 11 CT, um, while people are trickling in, I'll just take this opportunity to welcome everyone um, on behalf of Ground Truth Solutions and the IFRC. Um, and to thank you so much for choosing to spend the next 90 minutes with us. Um, it's great to see the number of participants going up by the second. Um, and also a special thank you to the CDAC network who has provided the, um, the technology for us to be able to host this today. Um, just a quick administrative point that we're going to be recording this session, which I hope is fine with everyone. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Meg Sattler and I work at Ground Truth Solutions. Um, it's quite an interesting time for us to be hosting such a discussion. Um, some of you would have seen yesterday the emergency relief coordinator's remarks in The Guardian highlighting um, as the key failing in our system, the ability to systematically listen to people in crisis and to demonstrate responsiveness to their views and priorities. Um, there are obviously various reactions to the proposed solution to that. Um, we at Ground Truth, for those of you who don't know us, are an organisation that facilitates listening to aid recipients across some of the biggest humanitarian responses and advocating for their views to be included in response planning, adaption and evaluation. Um, and I just wanted to draw attention to the fact that the latter part of that role is definitely the hardest. And it's been interesting to see there's been this real tendency as the accountability discussion has evolved um, quite rightly to try to bring it out of a theoretical realm and make it more practical. Um, but that has resulted in a real plethora of mechanisms and plans and AAP specialists and working group and such things um, that can provide some of the building blocks to accountability that we need, but definitely shouldn't be seen as the end goal. Um, from our perspective, we often get seen as a survey organisation, but I think we think that would be quite an irresponsible way for us to see ourselves, because really if nobody's listening to the data that we're collecting, then there's no point in us having collected it at all. And we shouldn't have borrowed the precious time of aid recipients to ask them the questions that we do. The point has to be that someone in a position of decision-making power somewhere listens to those views and acts on them. Um, so in planning for this session with the IFRC, we thought let's not again highlight our data, um, but let's rather hear from people who have actually done some of this really hard work to create systems in their organisations that facilitate using this data and listening to people. Um, if that's not happening, then this endless quest in our sector to sort of gather more and more data and present it in ever fancier ways and then obsessively try to aggregate it um, is just adding to the noise and not causing any of these shifts in reform that we're hoping to see. Um, so I guess now that the ERC has sort of thrust this issue back into the spotlight, um, let's try and grab this moment to bring these stories of listening to the fore, see how they can be taken further, how we can advocate for overcoming some of the challenges that make this work difficult. Um, and hopefully soon we'll be able to see all of this as standard practice everywhere, such that, you know, it shouldn't be interesting enough that we have to have a panel discussion about people listening to communities, but here we are. Um, so with that, I will hand over to Alex sikot um, from the IFRC for, for um, her quick thoughts. Thanks a lot. If Alex is not with us yet, um, I might in that case hand over to Jessica Alexander from the New Humanitarian, um, who has very kindly offered to moderate the discussion today. Hi, thanks everyone. Um, thank you, Meg, and um, thank you to um, Ground Truth Solutions and the Red Cross um, for giving me the opportunity to moderate this panel. It's something that I've been looking forward to for a while. Um, my name is Jessica Alexander. I'm a policy editor at The New Humanitarian. Um, and Accountability and feedback is something that um, I've been personally passionate about for a long time as a humanitarian aid worker. Um, and within the, the new humanitarian, which is 
um, as you know, a, a free independent media outlet which covers humanitarian issues. Um, I think in the absence of a, a formal regulatory framework, we really play a part of this accountability piece within the sector. And it's something that has been central to the new humanitarians reporting and coverage. And we'll actually be publishing soon a timeline of accountability initiatives over the years and developments in this space. So please stay tuned and watch out for that. Um, and as Meg said, I think it's clear that, that we've come a long way in improving mechanisms and feedback channels and the advocacy around accountability and listening to people has been quite effective. Um, no longer do accountability specialists need to struggle to get on the agenda. It's one of the priority areas of this conference, which is quite encouraging. Um, and it's really almost a staple of humanitarian policy and programming. Um, and there's been a lot of impressive work being done um, in this regard. Um, but as Meg you know, said, it doesn't stop with the mechanisms. And um, you know, we focused a lot on the mechanistic part of it, but what have been the results of these um, mechanisms? And are people in um, decision-making roles really listening to the feedback and how is it changing how we deliver aid? And so I think these are some of the questions that I hope we will be able to unpack with, with this impressive panel. And you know, the ERC's initiative, which Meg um, spoke to, um, you know, setting up this independent commission on voices for affected people is, is something that many in this space have been pushing for, advocating for, for many years. I think one of the encouraging signs is that, you know, he's asking for funds that OCHA manages, the SURF and the, the country-based pooled funds, um, to institute systems to, to prioritize allocations to programs that respond to affected people. Um, their expressed priorities. Um, often we hear that, you know, there's obstacles with regards to financing. So I think that that is a, a positive um, role that, that this commission can play. Um, but, you know, one of the questions that I think people have is that, you know, it's not something that's all that new. I mean, a few years ago when PSEA was getting a lot of attention, um, an, an independent commission was, was also proposed. Um, and we know from the past that these things need incentives and is an independent commission really enough or do we need something bolder? So it, it, I think it raises questions about how it will be enforced and by whom and will it have the teeth necessary to really flip the, the power imbalance in aid? Um, and just lastly, I think some of these, these AAP debates are, are tied to some of the other push which have gained a lot of momentum, especially this year around decolonization and, and localization and the need to, to shift the power balance uh, in, in aid. And there are a number of other exciting panels that are coming up um, in this conference, which we'll share at the end, um, but please stay tuned for those as well. So I've had the privilege to, to get some insight um, and the findings that you'll hear about today. And I'm really looking forward to elaborating more um, on them in this session. And we have um, David Giovanni, who is a policy advisor for the US Department of State with us here. But before I, I turn over to him, um, first, I just want to uh, say that the chat is open. We hope that you will put questions in the chat throughout the session. Please um, point the questions or direct the questions to an, to an individual panelist. Um, and we'll have time at the end to ask your questions. Um, but if you can direct them as much as possible to a, a particular speaker, that would be great. Um, but I just want to also see if, if Alex has joined and give her an opportunity to speak in case uh, she is with us before we're turning over to David. Alex? Yes, hi, Jess, I'm here. Um, thanks so much. And I mean, I'm not going to speak too long because in apologies, I was having some issues with my Zoom and I couldn't um, be on speaker view. Um, but just to say, I mean, I just want to emphasize what, what Meg said. I think for us, we've been coming to HNBW for years now. And I think some of us um, have been feeling a little bit like we're um, in an echo chamber of sorts talking about accountability over and over again, but not necessarily looking um, at the practi practicalities of it and what really we can do to address some some obstacles that we're still facing. I think we've done a lot in this field over um, the past couple of years, but um, there are still some critical obstacles. And I think our, our speakers today are really going to get to the heart of that. 
um, and, and hopefully this can inspire us to, to, to think as well and how do we collectively together, um, no matter if we're um, operational agencies or, or organizations like Ground Truth, and we also have donors on, on the line as well, how do we collectively together address some of these obstacles? Um, so, um, so I think this is a, a great opportunity today to really get into the practical aspect um, of how do we really use what we um, what we hear from communities and, and act on it. Um, so I'm hoping um, this session can help that turning point that we're facing the humanitarian system is uh, where, you know, as I said, we've had a lot of practice over the years, but there are still some transformative aspects that, that, that really need to happen. So, so I'll hand over to, um, to this for now and, and thanks so much, Jess. Thanks, Alex. Um, so again, before getting to um, what's happening on, on the ground, we thought we'd take it to first a, a global overview and get a, a perspective on the, the more macro trends. Um, and so I'm going to turn now to David D. Uh, D. Giovanni, as I said, he's policy advisor for the U.S. Department of State. He's calling in from the U.S. very early there. So thank you so much for for waking up. I hope you've had your coffee. Um, and you are the co-chair of the Grand Bargain Participation Revolution. And so I'm, we're hoping that you'll be able to speak a bit about what progress has been made in the past five years since signing on to these commitments. Has it been um, this kind of revolution? Um, where are we still falling short and, and what needs to change? Um, and you know, are we shifting the power dynamics involved in this enough and is feedback enough? So without further ado, um, over to you, David, and thank you again for, for your time and being here so early. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, and thank you for the invitation to speak today. Uh, good morning, all. I'm very pleased to see the large number of participants that we have on the call today. And I think that's a sign of the progress that we've made over the past several years in this field. The humanitarian community has made great progress over the past decade in understanding the meaning of accountability to affected persons. There is a, a broad acceptance of the value of community engagement in ensuring quality humanitarian programming. We have learned what to do and how to do it. Now we need to actually do it. In particular, we need to better use the feedback we collect to inform humanitarian programming. That means making accountability to aid recipients and communities an essential pillar of humanitarian planning, evaluation, and evolution of response. In the Grand Bargain Participation Revolution workstream that we discussed, in which I've been co-convener the past several years, we have worked to raise awareness of and champion participation, both as a concept and through specific examples and case studies. We are now working on a work plan for Grand Bargain 2.0 that focuses on completing the remaining unfilled Grand Bargain commitments. And these commitments include specifically, quote, building systematic links between feedback and corrective action to adjust programming, unquote. That's taken directly from the commitments that were made in the grand bargain as far back as 2016. As you said, Jessica, there is broad consensus that obstacles among the obstacles to effective participation are often power imbalances among humanitarians and between humanitarians and crisis affected communities. And that is why we need to focus on results and not mechanisms. Mechanisms can help, absolutely, but they don't automatically make anyone accountable. Until now, there has been too much attention on frameworks, processes, and so-called accountability activities but not enough attention to measuring impact and ensuring tangible change based on community input. We in the work stream are now in the process of designing a set of deliverables, again, for Grand Bargain 2.0, that focus precisely on these gaps. The deliverables seek to improve the implementation of the humanitarian program cycle by requiring detailed reporting on how responders have taken community perceptions into account, in part by the inclusion of perception-based indicators in humanitarian response plans. 
We will also call on donors to support accountability and responsiveness at the field level, including with adequate and flexible funding and by aligning donor accountability related partner requirements and monitoring partners' performance on responsiveness to community input. Finally, we will seek to strengthen the growing number of collective efforts at the response level, which Meg referred to earlier. This is, I think, a critical element in somewhere, something that we're really all as a community focusing on in the coming years. These efforts should include active collaboration and participation of local actors and ensure that measurable and comparable data derived from community feedback is collected, analyzed, and incorporated into programming in a collective manner. Examples like those we will hear today serve as an inspiration to us all. It will also be important to learn where the challenges are and why efforts that aim to see implementers act on community feedback rather than simply collected are often so difficult to get over the line. In The Guardian yesterday, which everyone has seen, I think Mark Lowcock was quoted as saying, quote, ultimately organizations or decision makers can choose to listen to people and be responsive, or they can choose not to. At the moment, there are no real consequences for the choice they make. There are weak incentives to push them in the right direction. Taking the next steps toward improved accountability to affected persons requires moving beyond a box ticking approach and the current focus on AAP frameworks. Instead, we need to measure the impact of those frameworks on programming. This should not be difficult. Many of the prerequisites are already in place. There is already a broad acceptance of the value of AAP, a commitment at senior levels by both donors and agencies in principle, and many tools and indicators. But we need to get better at making sure response leaders are taking it seriously. Many of the old excuses, we're too busy saving lives, we don't know how, there aren't enough resources, no longer stand up. If we follow through on our stated commitments to accountability, over the next several years, we should see a welcome, new, and improved system of accountability to communities within the humanitarian space and overall a more efficient and effective international humanitarian system. Personally, I'm very much looking forward to the experiences of the panelists here today. And I thank you again for giving me the opportunity to uh, participate. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, David, um, for that, that broad overview and for giving us sort of a, a rundown of where things stand with the Grand Bargain um, 2.0. So, Without further ado, I would, I'm excited to jump into um, the discussion with our panelists. And just so um, you all know who we are, we have a very diverse um, group with us. Um, we have two panelists who use feedback to improve their own organization's programming. And that is um, Lioba Mudungwe from the Zimbabwe Red Cross National Society and Safiula Khatibi from World Vision Afghanistan. We have Fatima Osman from MESH, which is an organization that collects feedback um, and tries to get other organizations to change their programming based on that feedback and the data that they collect. Um, and then we have um, Eve Ladem, who is um, from OCHA, Central African Republic. And they've been using feedback from communities and bringing it really into the, the coordination mechanisms and the leadership structures at the national level. So I see that some of you are, are introducing yourself and saying hello in the chat. I just want to remind you all as we move into the panel discussions to please put your questions um, in the chat and direct them to the, the um, appropriate panelists so that we can make sure to address them um, at the end. So I'd like to now turn to our first panelist um, from, uh, from calling in from Zimbabwe. Um, she is Leoba Mudungwe, a community engagement and accountability focal point for the Zimbabwe Red Cross National Society. Um, so hello, Leoba. Um, 
And I know that your, your presentation today is going to be really focusing on um, perceptions around the pandemic and COVID-19. Um, and the approach that, that you all took during COVID-19 was so impressive, it, it was featured on, on television. Um, so first, I'd love to hear a little bit more about um, what the Zimbabwe Red Cross National Society has done and some of the programmatic changes that you all made based on the feedback that you received. Over to you, Leoba. Thank you, Jess. Uh, good morning, everyone. And I'm also happy to be part of the panelists. And thank you for the question, Jess. So us as Zimbabwe Red Cross Society during the COVID-19, we Leoba, designed- Leoba, we can't hear you anymore. If maybe you've gone on mute or connection issues. Hello, Jess, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Jess. Uh, I was saying I'm happy to be part of the panelist and good morning, everyone. Uh, us as Zimbabwe Red Cross Society, what we first did was that uh, during the COVID-19, we designed a proactive feedback mechanism, which was a system where we were able to listen to the community's perceptions, views, fears, and um, their priorities. Uh, this survey was administered in our areas of intervention and also uh, in our to our beneficiaries. So the data was basically um, in the findings on the beneficiaries that uh, we were targeting. Of interest was that um, the data that we got managed to act as an early warning system to us uh, as the national society. Uh, I'll give a practical example. Last year, during the festive season of December, the perceptions, the data that we got showed that communities were afraid of relatives, children would come uh, for holidays. They were afraid that cases will rise. So when we got this feedback, we managed to use it to adjust our messaging, to increase the time of jingles which were being played during our radio stations, and also our awareness raising through the Ministry of Health and working with our volunteers on ground. We managed to increase that. Well, our cases of COVID-19 increased in Zimbabwe in January, but then uh, we'd see that maybe there would have been more uh, without us having uh, done the awareness session. So this was really great and uh, it was very useful in, uh, in assisting us as a national society and other humanitarian actors in Zimbabwe. And then also we managed to change our risk communication messaging, which was developed and adjusted to suit what the community wanted, their priorities and needs. You will find out that from the results and the findings that we got, uh, many were saying that they were finding it hard to wear masks due to due to the weather um, to the weather um, platforms. For instance, some are hot, so the mask were hot to them. So our messaging uh, was now focused on how best uh, they can adhere to the regulations. Messaging was done also on on so for everyone to be able to adhere. The importance was laid out through different use of um of feedback mechanisms. Uh, we also managed to engage more, network more, and cooperate with different actors within the country. Uh, as an organization from the findings, we got that uh, many people, like people living with uh, disabilities and the elderly were struggling to access information on COVID-19. Through, um, through these findings, we managed to make sure that we act more, we engaged our Ministry of Health, we engaged organizations working with the elderly, organizations working with people living with uh, disabilities in different districts so that uh, we can work collectively uh, to make sure that the messaging reach out to them to the communities. Also, as part of the feedback that we collected, we managed to strengthen our feedback mechanism and also document everything that we'll be receiving and ensure that uh, it is acted upon in responding to what the communities would have, uh, would have said that they need. And also, as for, for the National Society, and also as the feedback um, in, our, in our National Society is being sort of being introduced now it's quite being recognized as a cross-cutting factor in all projects where we are being recognized where systems are being set in different projects so that they can be implemented and also maybe one last plus uh, on this one on the changes that we made we managed to advocate that we conduct another round of the COVID-19 perception survey which we are going to track the changes for the first round that we did 
And this time we're also going to do the second round. And of interest, we have also included questions to do with vaccine and to hope that we are going to, to get more interesting findings, which will also assist us in terms of our creation of demand, in terms of messaging to put out to the communities. Thank you, Jess. Over to you. Wow, thanks, Leoba. That was quite comprehensive and, and impressive. Um, I'm curious what you think were, were some of the ingredients for success. Were there any enabling factors which help you um, to be able to change these messages, adjust your messages based on the feedback that you received? Um, can you talk a little bit about what went into um, making it such a successful program and initiative? Oh, thank you, Jess, for the question. Uh, firstly, I would say that uh, capacity building was one of the key enablers that um, that managed us to be successful. Uh, we had the assistance of Ground Truth, which capacity the CA focal point, our monitoring and evaluation department, uh, where we work together, we capacitated on what, what is needed to be done, the processes, how to collect, how to analyze the issue of dissemination and reaching out to the communities. So one key fact that was an ingredient to our success is capacity building, which we also, the team that was capacitated was sort of a short group, and then we went on further to capacitate our staff that is within all the different portfolios. And one of the key factors was that we managed to get buy-in from staff and uh, other different uh, projects. So as I was saying that, um, it is now being recognized as a necessity in all the projects as a cross-cutting factor is it is so buy-in from from the staff the senior management was really great in assisting us to succeed and then uh, of other key interesting factor was wide dissemination uh, of our findings so what we did was that we made sure that the findings that we got were disseminated through the social media platforms that we have, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and also the radio stations, the community radios that reach out to different people, the national television uh, managed to, to, um, to present our findings. And also we reached out to, to the government, the national government from the national province up to the grassroots level. We managed to disseminate our information. And then also we have a Zimbabwe CA thematic working group with different uh, organizations that we're working in. So we managed to share our findings. So it might not be really us working out on responding feedback, but other organizations coming in and in, using the data that we have found. And then as a collective group, we make sure that um, our information is shared, we disseminate, and where there are loopholes, we assist each other and agree on what we can do. And then uh, we also managed to do um, to leave a platform or a room for co-creating recommendations and solutions at different levels, which were then triangulated to find that uh, this can work and then we drive lessons learned and we quickly act on them uh, as they will be still relevant. And one also key factor was that uh, our budgets were made to be flexible. So it was easier for us to adjust to what the communities need and also their priorities. Thank you. Great, thanks so much, Leo. But there, there were two points that that you brought up just now, um, which I, I'd love to drill down on just briefly. Um, you know, we often hear that um, buy-in from, especially at leadership levels, can be an obstacle to to doing um, to getting feedback and actually use it. Um, and you mentioned that you had uh, buy-in from staff um, at the, the local levels and also at leadership level. Um, can you unpack that a little bit, how you, how you were able to get that buy-in? Were they on board from the outset? Was there any um, initial resistance? Um, what, what was the process in getting that kind of buy-in? Okay, uh, thank you, Jess. Uh, on the buy-in, what we did first was that we had to train our staff on the importance of collecting feedback, acting on it, and also uh, the recommendations. So we managed to to gather all the staff members, some of the staff members that we were working in for that particular project, and then train them. And if there were any questions, they would have, they were asked. It, so that um, everyone can get the same page. We know the importance. And if we are talking, we are talking about one thing. So that was the first thing that we did, a training, to ensure that everyone knows on the importance um, 
or feedback that we were collecting. And also we managed to get hold of our senior management. It was, they were really helpful in assisting us because uh, it's not an easy task to say that if feedback is important, we need to act on it. It's quite a process, but through the assistance of our senior management, we had to sit down, show them what the work that we're doing, show them also the importance and how it will assist us as a national society in ensuring accountability at Brussels level in the communities that we're working. So buy-in uh, was easier to doing so to the field staff and to our leadership. And then uh, also a part, we did a practical example, like for the COVID-19 perception survey we did, we collected the feedback, we engaged everyone. We, we also managed to engage with key stakeholders. And after, um, after having done that, they, we co-created solutions and recommendations. And when we're implementing now, responding to, to what the communities would have said at, grad, at grassroots level, we managed to implement that without facing any challenges, without facing any resistance on the ground. So this was done uh, collectively as a team and everyone was on the same page. So it's not an easy task, but what we need to do is to train first, engage further, make sure that people know what we are doing. So thank you very much. I think on this one, those were the two key factors that we did, training and also demonstrating practical examples. Thank you. That's great. Um, and I think the practical examples that we'll hear more about today also will reinforce this at, at a more global level. And just finally, um, on this issue of flexible budgets, um, how how did you go about advocating for those, and what when was this done during the process? Was it when you were agreeing to um, the program, or was it um, once you got feedback um, to inform changes? Um, can you talk a little bit about the the process for advocating for these flexible budgets with with donors and how receptive they were to that? Okay, uh, thank you, Jess. So this uh, this is a hard one, but well, uh, what we did first, um, we did a data process after we had disseminated our, um, when we started disseminating the data that we had got. Uh, for instance, maybe on our planning, we had said that uh, we're going to do, um, we're going to distribute our buckets instead as an example. But then uh, after our findings, we noted that people wanted uh, maybe support with masks so that they can protect them. So they wanted branded masks, which um, which had the standard quality, which was required by, by the health regulations. So what we did was that with our findings, we managed to, to go to our senior management. As I said, they were very supportive after we told them what we were doing. Uh, we engaged them, we showed them the findings and we showed them how, how we had planned, we had pre-planned our activities and showing them now that based on these findings, they were now not relevant to the context that we're working. So we needed to, to adjust our messaging and also our activities to suit what the communities wanted. So we told them that it was um, of importance to adjust the budgets and also to realign the activities now relevant to the communities. So we didn't face any, any challenges showing the findings, the effects on, on the paper and showing them the results. It was easier for them to understand the importance of it and that uh, we can be flexible. So with the assistance of the senior management, um, they managed now to get hold of the partner so that we can adjust what was planned and how best can we cut what activities. So after doing that process, it was really easier for the budgets to be flexible. So for now, they are flexible. If I have any any changes that I would have um any changes that would be needed, we can easily communicate and then it will be documented. So I think what is very key is to communicate effectively engage more um, as a team in reaching out so that uh, it can be flexible. Thank you so much. Leoba, thank you so much for, for these insights. Um, and I see that there's a lot of activity in the chat. Um, so again, if you have any questions uh, directly for, for Leoba, we'll be getting to those uh, at the end of the, the panelists. But Thank you for, for sharing with us. Um, I'm gonna now turn over to um, Fatima Osman, who is the head of learning and change at Mesh Somalia. Um, hello, Fatima. Good morning, Jessica. Thank you so much for being with us. Um, 
your your work is important um, because it's about using community feedback um, for monitoring and evaluation. Um, and you know this is uh, often missing from from humanitarian work. Can you first just start by telling us a little bit more about um, Mesh and what it does? Uh, yes, Jessica, and good morning to you all. Um, monitoring and evaluation of a Somalia humanitarian uh, resilience and health program, which is abbreviated as MESH, is um, a suite of monitoring, evaluation, and learning and change approaches and tools primarily to validate results across uh, the FCDO funded partnerships, implementing partnerships in Somalia. Uh, specifically, we support uh, the partners within the Sharp and Shine partnerships, which are the, um, the emergency and the health partners to use evidence to improve performance. Fatima, are you there or is that my connection? Um, can others hear Fatima? No, we can't hear her. No, okay. We're monitoring activities, oh. but we core focus on um, learning and change activities, increasing types and, and frequency of thematic briefs, rapid reviews, um, ETC, ETC, but all of it is really driven um, in, in a systematic engagement with partners, uh, revised approaches that really um, drive the uptake of evidence and try to um, improve how we approach things. Um, over to you, Jessica. Great, thanks, Fatima. Um, how, how do you work with partners? Um, can you talk a little bit about that process um, to make sure that they use the feedback for change. Um, and, you know, do you have any examples that you can point to that demonstrate where they've taken this feedback and actually made, um, made changes in their programming? Uh, yes, um, I can tell you one thing for sure. It's a very commitment intensive uh, effort. Um, and, and for Mesh's part, the, at the heart of this commitment is um, the action-based learning process, which derives from um, a collection, the collection of partner call center and field monitoring data. Uh, and just quickly to run through it, following each monitoring exercise, the learning and change team holds reflective discussions with individual partners across the partnership, across implementing partnership. We compare data sets, we discuss underlying issues, and critically, we develop a course of responsive action. Um, these actions are then circulated to both the partner for follow-up and F uh, FCDO as well. Uh, and then MESH continuously tracks these actions. We have multiple discussions from that point with partners on progress, on bottlenecks. Our experience is that on average, it takes two to four weeks and anything from that to about nine to 10 months, depending on what's being you know, addressed here. Um, so, so far, uh, out of 30 monitoring surveys we've done since March 29, reaching over 100,000 beneficiary households, we have had 28 action-based learning discussions with partners. And in the first instance, the ABL or the action-based learning reflection, reflection process has allowed MESH to immediately spotlight areas that require immediate action. But gradually what we found that is that we are also building a consolidated body of insights on partner activities, over several points in time, which allows us, or rather has allowed us to form and present really um, a more discerning analysis of partner delivery and systems. I would say that the issues we highlight have fallen into two categories. There are those accountability related ones requiring immediate follow-up to establish and, and respond to the risk of fraud. And then we have the medium to longer term ones related to strengthening systems and addressing um, issues of program quality, risk management, and so forth. If I could give a, uh, um, one quick example, and I feel like we have such a number of compelling um, instances where we have worked with our partners to be able to, to turn things around for the better, is um, for one of our cash, uh, our call center cash surveys based on mesh, mesh feedback, um, the partner followed up 
Uh, and this confirmed that despite the available sensitization mechanisms targeted at empowering beneficiaries on how to um, avoid and report involuntary payments, it remained an actively recurring risk. Uh, what the partner follow-up established is that a number of beneficiaries had indeed made involuntary payments to access entitlements as had been flagged by MESH. Uh, and immediately based on, on the agreed action they took, they responded to address the issue, working closely with local authorities to ensure the identified perpetrators were held responsible for their actions and additionally held higher uh, and operational level meetings with the downstream implementing partner, um, reiterating the importance of thorough beneficiary sensitization. But even, uh, more critical, I would say, is that the partner designed a new strategy to augment direct communication to beneficiaries and strengthen understanding on entitlements and existing accountability mechanisms. So this was, for example, um, increased engagement with beneficiaries by sending SMS messages and distributing um, more targeted sensitization posters at delivery or registration sites as well as really encouraging, rolling out this campaign to encourage beneficiaries to report any implementation issues directly through the beneficiary hotline. Um, additionally, to monitor the implementation and impact of these measures, the partner father designed a follow-up uh, post-distribution survey, which is regularly administered. And so again, mesh job is not done because based on all these changes, we keep tracking how um, they are performing and what other challenges exist with as the activities keep happening throughout the life of the program. Uh, over to you, Jessica. Um, that's great and and such a, a rich example of where um, this has been been used. I'm curious about some of the obstacles that you face. Um, when you know asking others to use the feedback data that you've collected for change, um, has there been some some resistance from organizations, and and how have you um, overcome any of those those obstacles? Uh, yes, Jessica. So the thing that came immediately to mind um, is that mesh our core job is really collecting all this information. It is data, it's analytics, it's insights. And so then we have to present it and discuss it, bring it to the table. Um, and so sometimes we encounter um, the, the response of, yeah, but that's just your opinion. Um, and I would say data in our business is, is not a definitive or perfect picture of performance. And indeed uh, we have experienced there'll never be a perfect data set. Uh, that can't be assailed in one way or another by observers or users. And certainly our own data does get questioned uh, by partners, particularly when it's in contrast to their own, with their own perceptions and evidence. Uh, while this doesn't happen a significant amount, we still get a bit of pushback on some of the findings, especially those that keep recurring and, and partners feel that again, we have to follow up on this again. Um, so one, we use multiple levels to address this. One, to overcome this, our consistent, me consistent message during the action-based learning discussions is one, really trust the data if it adheres to basic standards. Uh, if the data says something happened, some change occurred, even if there are gaps, there are anomalies, there are issues with methodology, trust that it is likely there is a level of accuracy in it. Uh, we could be using statistical modeling for certainty. We could have a variety of non-quantitative factors, but there is no accepted gold standard. Uh, and, and we really draw on the insights and experience of, of the team that we have to interpret the results, take into consideration strengths and weaknesses, data sets, ETC, ETC. Um, and, and we encourage that, and even as we drive action-based learning discussion, we focus on, instead of spending time questioning the accuracy of the data, what we feel is useful is to use the data to focus on insights and promote new and useful areas of inquiry, um, focusing really on pinpointing issues uh, that merit attention and raising new and compelling questions. 
um, as much as answering the previous questions. But then on the other hand of the spectrum, we encourage, we, we rather we encounter instances where partner commitment to make necessary changes are curtailed by contextual strategic and funding restrictions to effectively do so. I think one of those Lioba already mentioned around their flex budget flexibilities, which is not something that all agencies encounter. Um, and I, I would say a quick example um, is, again, one of our uh, cash partners efforts to respond to mesh feedback related to beneficiaries not receiving full entitlements uh, due to being overcharged by retailers. However, in this case, beneficiaries clammed up and really would not name the retailers, which made it difficult for partners to take appropriate action, um, considering lack of evidence. We have um, another quick example is um, uh, the process we use to strengthen partner disability inclusion, which is also derived from our surveys. Uh, and despite the extensive discussions related to disability inclusion and the encouraging strides we feel our partners um, make in this area, uh, we have instances where programs were designed as far back as 2018 and did not really have a, a vulnerability targeting that actively included people with disabilities. And, and so when we have this conversation at this point, um, while it presents an opportunity to review and adjust the approach, it has to be escalated to the donor. It would potentially involve an expansion of the original target. This, is, um, this would likely be hindered by budget considerations. And so we do encounter so many, um, we do or rather we perceive a number of challenges and how we've, we've really tried to work with this uh, or rather resolve these challenges is we have worked to continuously highlight um, by investing really heavily in collaborative partnerships with both the implementing partners and with the donor. The discussions and, and the key issues that we raise through the action-based learning really are not responded to in isolation. Rather, we have, we, we have a continuous communication and feedback loop that involves many other processes, including partner reviews, uh, partner strategy discussions, ad hoc meetings. And I, I, I'd say that while bringing this all together cohesively has been a learning curve for us it is clear that a very crucial part of our role is being an effective bridge between the donor and partners so sometimes flagging issues that need reinforcement from the donor uh, to ensure partners are responding and sometimes being advocates for the partners and the challenges um, they encounter it it I, it has also involved i should say this if i haven't before a massive amount of follow-up and consistent tracking on mesh spot. Uh, over to you, Jess. Well, thanks so much, uh, Fatima. So many really um, interesting learnings um, from your work there. And I think what you mentioned around these collaborative partnerships, you know, we also heard that um, from Leoba in the, in the previous uh, presentation um, where she highlighted also cooperation with stakeholders and the importance of um, some of these, these partnerships with, with, um, within the whole system. Thank you so much for sharing your experience um, with Mesh. I'm going to now um, turn to um, Eve Ledem, who is humanitarian officer uh, with OCHA for the Central African Republic. She's calling in them from, from Paris, France. Um, hello, Eve. Hello, Jess. How are you? Thank you. I'm good. <laughs> Thank you very much. Good. Um, so we just heard um, two different uh, perspectives, one from the programming level, another one, you know, using um, data to then report back to organizations. You're working on the coordination side, um, in particular with the UN and all the stakeholders there. And, mm -hmm. you know, we, we often hear that there is reluctance to adapt to feedback um, by leadership. Um, but you guys have really been the antithesis of this um, and you've proven that it's you know it's possible to include uh, response-wide feedback throughout the humanitarian program cycle and you've been doing this for a couple of years um, and you know in CAR you've created this culture of listening to crisis affected people um, in coordination and leadership structures so how did you do it um, you know how did you did you mainstream this listening uh, to communities um, throughout the HPC are there particular points within the HPC where it was easier than others, you know, perhaps a needs analysis or programming. Um, so can you just talk us through a little bit about how that works in your context? Yes, for sure. Thank you, Jess. Well, maybe I need to start by 
uh, stressing that uh, AAP is part of the HCT compact. It's like one of the key uh, transversal issue mainstream by the intercluster. So what helps is that we do have a collective engagement to integrate AAP uh, all over, including with senior leaderships. That helps. But usually when we actually talk about integrating feedbacks, AAP inside the HPC, it's a lot of acronyms and it's make it sound like super heavy, constraining, complicated. Um, and I think we, we need to get back to basics and, and HNO is truly about uh, listening to people's voice, tell us about their situation, their needs, and how we are supposed to address them. And, um, and I think we, we succeeded to, de to do just that. So uh, here in Cal last year, we put it an extra effort to actually beyond the COVID-19 epidemics, beyond the complicated, truly complicated security situation, um, we actually interviewed over uh, 16,000 households over the country to inform the HNO. And equally important to us, uh, beyond collecting this information, we wanted to make it right and to make it useful. That's something I believe um, Meg said at the beginning, uh, we needed to know that every piece of information we actually collect will be used. Uh, because we know, we heard in car and I guess in other country, um, that people are tired of answering a uh, question over and over again without seeing a meaningful change. So beyond designing the right sample, we actually work together to, to collect the, the right piece of information. And I believe it was worth people's time um, because when we did publish our HNO last year, and once again in March, we published our HNO light. Uh, I think when governments, humanitarian partners um, and donors actually read it, uh, they saw that we put uh, people at the center of the HNO in all their complexities. Um, and that is our advocacy um, entry point, meaning like it is about how we convince the leader not to forget about car crisis. And such a solid HNO, I believe, actually set up the basis for a strong and multi-sectorial and prioritized uh, HRP. And our response strategy, although the document is long, is quite straightforward. It's about uh, delivering quickly, efficiently, and in a protective manner to the most severe needs. Uh, and including in our to reach areas where people actually told us they feel abandoned and have no basic, no access to basic social services. And how to do so, how to implement this, this reference in an efficient manner, that is where um, feedbacks actually matter to tailor good programming. So for instance, community told us they want cash, so we did push um, to, to increase and scale up the volume of cash activities. Uh, we doubled it from uh, 2019 to 2020. Um, so cash is one way. When people tell us and run through solution perception, survey shows just that, that they feel like the elder or the people living with disabilities are often forgotten. We did collectively uh, improve our programming specifically towards these people and also make sure that um, in all programming they will have better access uh, to the service we do provide. And so we still have a lot of efforts to do about it. I, are you talking? Oh. But yeah, and maybe one last example about good program tailoring to the, the HPC um, and the HRP specifically is when People told us inside the REACH MSNA or the Grand Truth Perception Survey that they do not understand how do we target beneficiaries. So we did increase our communication towards uh, the communities and explain better over and over uh, how do we uh, choose who receive head or not and why and how. Um, and just one week ago, we, we did train uh, 
over a dozen of journalists that will be deployed on the field to talk about humanitarian principle. And so we explained to them before they deployed, how do we proceed? How do we evaluate needs and how um, we target so they can discuss that with the community uh, on the field. Great, thanks. That was super comprehensive. Um, I'm curious about, you know, how you get funding for these activities. And I think that's something that, you know, was mentioned um, in, in the, I think the first presentation around, you know, how do we, we finance and get flexible funding um, to adapt to the changes or to the feedback that, that we hear. Um, can you talk a little bit about the resource mobilization side of it, um, especially when it comes to um, doing these things and also making changes and, and course corrections on the basis of feedback? Yeah, thank you. Well, we do know that every donor is pay attention to AAP, it's a, it's a requirement. But sometimes funding for actual AAP project, uh, innovative one, is quite complicated. So here in CAR, and, and you did mention uh, CBPF role in, in that. So we made a strategic decision to use the CAR humanitarian fund to actually kick off a specific AAP project. Um, and AAP activities. So I mentioned rich MSNAs, uh, but also Grand True Solution Perception Surveys, and now uh, Grand True Solution Mapping of uh, Feedback Mechanism Activities. And we do know that mapping them is the first step to harmonize them and, and do things better, but also our collective information and feedback centers, that's all projects that we've been able to start with our uh, humanitarian fund, and so once it starts, we will be able to have more intentions uh, from other donors. So I believe from 2019 to 2020, over about like 2 million USDs uh, were allocated only to AAP activities. And maybe beyond our um, CBPF role, I think that across all countries, what is important is that to galvanize funding, you need to demonstrate AAP value for money. And, and its impact. So first, to, to us, AAP programming is of specific activities or also mainstreaming AAP in, in programming in other clusters, et cetera. It does lead to a better response, a response that is closer to the people and that can actually make a change and that people understand. Um, so, for example, uh, just last year, you know, when the COVID-19 pandemic uh, hit car, uh, we listened to the people and people did not fear the health impact that much of the pandemic, the young population, etc. But they did fear the socioeconomic impact and, and the protection risks that will come with um, the closure of school, etc. So what we did is that we took that into consideration and beyond Health specific programming for COVID-19. We did scale up our cash activities to support the people who were uh, the most affected by the socioeconomic impact of COVID-19. We changed our value of transfer to change with them um, to adapt with inflation, etc. And we did a big scale up for specifically COVID-19 um, vulnerabilities, cash intervention. And also, at the same time, to address the protection needs, we did increase a decentralized response in VBG and child protection. And um, and yes, and it, it, it was better. And I think it, it has a really important impact. And maybe on this and about galvanized funding, another point is that beyond leading to a better response, AAP does lead to a safer one. And it is important. Um, in a complicated and dangerous context like CAR is that AP allows us to stay and deliver. When people know why we're here and how do we proceed, it leads to acceptance. So it's not only a better response, but it's a safer one. Great, thank you. Um, just very briefly, um, because it's been touched on in the past presentations, um, you know, how, how do you, in this coordination role, promote cooperation on feedback between organizations? And are there any examples where you get conflicting feedback? And what do you do um, in those cases um, as the coordinator? 
Yes, uh, thank you. Well, that's a tricky question because now we do know that in every, I think, uh, donor proposal, you will have to put something on AAP. But sometimes it's only to tick the box and ticking the box means actually quite ironically having a suggestion box uh, in the area you implement your project. But what happened like when my organization receive a paper that is directed to another organization or is that uh, a woman, a mother call my my outline and tell me about the protection risks they face while I'm only an NGO having food distribution. And to create bridges between these different feedbacks and to move uh, towards more collective mechanism. And we did answer these questions co collectively in, car in, in different ways. First, uh, when looking at feedbacks data, we actually found common problems. So we found collective solution, global solution in car to, this, to these problems. So for instance, people did tell us, as I mentioned, that they wanted more cash. Cash is the modality they prefer in every sector but health. So what we did is that we have a complicated environment for cash. I mean, there is two banks outside the capital, big insecurity problem, etc. But people want cash. So how do we do this collectively in a protective manner? For example, we sit with different financial institutions. So to have better rates for us, and for instance, to compromise on the documentation needed for cash, because they want official ID, people in car mainly don't have official IDs. So common problems and collective solution. And also, and I think that's really important, uh, maybe for sure we try to develop collective mechanism, but what is truly important also is to make the best use we can of common channel of communication. Maybe a concrete example um, is also related to, to COVID-19, is that last year, last spring, when COVID-19 arrived uh, in Central African Republic, a lot of NGOs, UN agencies, started uh, awareness raising activities about preventive measures, et cetera. And we know that when we are door to door uh, to spread this message about how to prevent COVID-19, we actually talk to the people, but they also respond. They share their fear, they share the rumors they heard on the radio or when going uh, on a community activities. So what we did is to capitalize on that and we created um, a joint tool to actually collect and document the feedback of the communities so i think we had over like about 1800 uh qualitative feedbacks from over a dozen ngos and we analyzed them together and and from this collective effort we were able not only to change the, our messaging but also to develop new products such as rumor tracking bulletin and also to actually adapt the overall response. And maybe lastly, um, for sure we need to make better use of the existing information, but if we can have actual collective um, mechanism, it, it's, a, it's a better way. So um, we do uh, from like about four, four months now, have an interagency collective feedback and information centers in IDP site, uh, in, in, in Bria, and now we're trying to open them in, in two other cities. And this will help us to systemically document feedbacks, complain, requests for information of the IDPs. And so not only to respond to them individually at a programmatic level, for the odd NGO that is concerned by the feedbacks, but also to have it consider and analyze at leadership level by the ICC, by the HCT, and so to change it systematically. So we have a programming and strategic uh, change. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Eve. Um, that was really um, insightful. I wanna quickly turn now to um, Safiullah Khatibi, 
who is an accountability specialist at World Vision Afghanistan. Um, and hello, Safila. Hi. Hi. Um, so, so you're working in, in a context with a strong and solid culture of grassroots community feedback. Um, and we know that World Vision has been a, a catalyst for, for promoting this. Um, and in particular, it's been inspiring to many other actors uh, in country. So can you just talk us quickly through how World Vision is collecting feedback um, and how these, these mechanisms work um, and also some of the changes that have resulted from, from the channels that you've set up? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, just uh, let me have a uh, quick introduction about World Vision Afghanistan and then um, uh, respond to your question. Uh, World Vision Afghanistan uh, has been um, since 2001 in Afghanistan and work in uh, three provinces. To be uh, accountable, to make sure that we are accountable for the uh, communities we are working, uh, World Vision globally has a program accountability framework with four pillars, uh, having uh, uh, the pillars are um, providing information for the community, consulting with them, promoting participation, and also the last one, which is uh, collecting and acting on feedbacks and complaints of the community. Um, so um, let me explore an example of the changes uh, that uh, we have been able to to create uh, based on the community feedback that we received uh, from the community. Uh, uh, recently on a cash intervention that we have had, uh, our beneficiaries um, uh, register uh, their uh, complaints and, and feedback that the community leaders asking them about uh, to, to share is entitlement with them. So this was the challenge that we have been um, faced for, for, a, for, a, for a time and the beneficiary were not satisfied with, the, with, this, with this way and they uh, connected us uh, on uh, solving this issue. So uh, for, for handling this issue, we uh, connected with the beneficiaries and also the uh, community on how we can best um, uh, solve this issue, the feedbacks on the community. So, um, uh, so we, we just um, went to the community and consulted with the, the, with the community, trusted people, uh, local government, uh, to address the issue. And also we wanted to uh, just um, address this um, feedback systematically, not just into the individual uh, feedbacks of the community. So uh, we, we uh, in coordination and, and in cooperation of the community, we decided to establish some community committee so that they can, um, so that the people from their community can uh, address and, and, and solve the, uh, the feedbacks that uh, there are uh, on our uh, on, on the activity. So uh, this was the, the this was a life example that we, in coordination of the community, uh, um, had uh, in, in, in addressing the uh, feedbacks of the community. So the outcome for um, this committees were that the community. Uh, we're uh, satisfied and we're happy that uh, uh, there are some some committees for us addressing this issue. And also, we have had um, uh, a lot a lot of uh, uh, number of uh, issues on this um, uh, intervention. But after establishing this um, committee, uh, we witnessed uh, an overall redu uh, reduction in the community feedbacks and complaints in in. Um, that that area that we uh, we were uh, uh, doing the activity, yeah. Great, thanks. Um, I want to just turn to to power dynamics because that's been sort of a theme that's related to accountability and also these issues around um, decolonization and localization. And you know, unless we do flip the the power imbalances in aid, we won't truly be accountable to people. And how? Um, how have you done this? How have you created this environment of trust? Can you talk a little bit about your, your experience with this um, in the communities that, that you're working with? 
Yeah, uh, so, uh, you know, we are working in a, in a diverse uh, community, diversity exists in all of the community that we are uh, working, people with uh, uh, vulnerability, different vulnerability, and also some strengths that we can, um, we can um, uh, consider. So, uh, what vision um, to, uh, to make sure that we have, um, we have, uh, uh, we have, uh, uh, the power is equal for, for everyone and everyone can, can uh, um, refer us on uh, the, the activity that we are implementing in their community. So uh, to make sure that uh, this is happening, we, um, we at World Vision uh, have um, uh, community um, information provi uh, provided for every community for different groups that are in the community so that everyone inside the community are aware of uh, our presence there, what we are doing in their community, and also what ca can they expect from our organization and also our staff and, and, and the, the person who are representing World Vision in their community. And also they have, uh, we make sure that they, they, they know they have the right to, uh, to, to uh, provide their feedbacks and raise their voices if they think there, is, uh, there are some, some problems with what we are doing in their community. And also uh, make sure that uh, they are consulted in, in, in different phases of the, uh, the project and also uh, being uh, participated and then promote their participation in different stages of uh, the community. And also we for doing this, we hold, uh, we conduct uh, FGDs with the community and also um, uh, telling them uh, this, that, and uh, hearing from them their methods for, for uh, their participation and also the way they can uh, provide their feedbacks in a, in a, in a preferred uh, way. And also recently we have been able to, um, to have child-friendly accountability system for uh, for our project for our child focused project uh, and protection project so uh, in that uh, activity in that system we uh, we just uh, hear uh, the feedbacks from the children and also uh, our activities uh, staff buildings and everything uh, that we are providing for them in their community so uh, uh, since children are um, different from the adults so we have a specific uh, uh, child-friendly accountability system that uh, uh, to make sure that children uh, all, are also able to to um, to just uh, come to us and also uh, uh, raise their voices also one of the findings that um, we received from the this uh, child-friendly uh, uh, accountability system the children were uh, telling us that the, the location that the activity is actually uh, implementing or they participate in that location is not um, a good place for them. And they, uh, they told us that um, uh, they don't like uh, the, the place. So we are working actually on, on, on changing the location. So this is a life example that uh, children uh, were um, uh, or um, uh, saying their feedbacks and, and expressing them to us. And also that com community committee was also another uh, example uh, that I mentioned earlier that um, community has uh, the power to, to uh, raise their voice and also everyone in the community uh, and uh, they, this can uh, improve their ownership and also they can influence our uh, decision making. Great, thank you. Um, and and when you say they can influence the decision making, um, you know, how how do you deal with um, having the kind of flexibility to to act on the feedback that you receive? What's been your experience with that? Because we often hear that that is um, a, a, a difficult for many organizations. So how has World Vision dealt with um, this this dilemma? Um, and, and briefly, as we're, we're getting close to the, the end of the session, we want to make time for questions. Thanks so much. Yeah. Um, so um, this is true that um, sometimes uh, agencies and organizations are receiving feedbacks um, that they, they cannot um, resolve on the spot. For example, some, some, uh, some changes that they request to uh, make during the project and also some other things. But... Um, 
the thing that we we here uh, do at World Vision is we are um, um, a member of the AAP working group. Uh, so uh, we are there and the organization and as or uh, and also as um, uh, share the the trends, the need trend, the feedback trends from the community. Some some needs and some feedbacks that we we are not able to to address on the spot or uh, in a short time. So we just um, uh, report them and, and share those trends in the in the in, the, in that AAP group uh, working group. And also we receive um, feedbacks over time. We we just record the feedback trends on the needs and also um, the uh, the compilates or the the things that the community are asking us to to consider in our programming. So we uh, we record that feedback trends and also um, we share that with the uh, we share that with with the senior management in World Vision Afghanistan and globally we share it with the World Vision International uh, to. Uh, to consider uh, those trends and those common trends, uh, trends in their um, uh, strat global strategy and, and uh, influence uh, uh, the decision making for, uh, for uh, World Vision globally. Yeah, over to you. Great, thank you so much, Safiullah. Um, I, I want to um, now just go through a few of the, the questions that, that we've received from, um, from you all, the, the audience. Um, this one is, the, the first one is mainly for, I think, operational folks, and maybe we'll start with um, Leoba. And again, just want to um, reiterate, please keep your, your answers brief as we're getting to the, to the end of the session. And I would like to get as many questions as possible. Um, but we had a comment that, you know, we have long observed that, the chief executive, um, that if the chief executive uh, gets it, um, then it's much easier for champions to make it work and that this is sort of a familiar story. Um, um, so Leo, do you have any tips on advocating to leadership? Okay, uh, thank you, Jess. I think I have only two tips. The first one is that uh, we need to engage further. We need to engage more. When we engage more, it's easier when we, we are trying to advocate. So engagement is one key aspect that is needed. And we need to communicate effectively and efficiently. And uh, the message that we'll be portraying when we're advocating is to be clear. So I think those are the key two tips that we need to, to add to. One, engaging and being effective in communicating. Thank you. Thanks. What about you, Eve? Do you have any thoughts um, on tips for advocating to, to leadership? Thank you, Jess. Uh, no, I think she, she covered it. Maybe uh, I saw just like one question that is addressed to me about tackling power imbalance between the, the UN and humanitarian actors in the communities. And and for me, what I will have to two words for that is actually to respond to feedback because if we collect them and we don't respond they get back to the communities they won't uh give us any feedbacks any longer so i believe responding to them each one uh individually is important and maybe also explain explain and explain what we're doing and why and and, and that's that's the basic of access and, and acceptation and always uh, when possible in the local language um, and yeah, close to the people and a decentralized response do just that. Thank you. Great, thanks. And um, just, you know, one question to, to everyone um, and we can maybe start uh, with you, Safiula. Um, we focused a lot today on, on using feedback to adapt programs as they unfold. But do we have any examples of feedback mechanisms or participatory approaches being used to understand community priorities, not necessarily their needs, um, and develop community-defined indicators that capture these priorities and, and hold agencies to account on the basis to um, promote better design and adaptation? 
Um, well, I, I, I won't call on, on people, but maybe if, if you have any, if someone, one of the panelists jump in around um, the, the examples of feedback mechanisms for understanding community priorities. Um, just let me, um, yeah. Um, so diff, uh, community priorities are different in every, um, every community. And uh, for World Vision Afghanistan, we have been able to, uh, to have um, um, focus group discussion, accountability assessments, and also IP uh, information provision session with different uh, communities uh, that we are working. So uh, for us that we, uh, we, um, we did these activities, uh, it was clear for us that um, the, the preferences of the community and the priority that they are, um, uh, they have in their, uh, in their community. So having this FGD, having um, the channels, the uh, uh, different channels for their community, made us able to understand their priorities and also uh, connect, connecting communication with the community and also from different approaches uh, made us able to, to uh, just um, uh, uh, be aware of these uh, priorities. Great, thank you. Um, I don't know if Fatima, you have any thoughts on, on that question and using it for, um, to identify priorities? Uh, nothing from me, Jessica. Okay. Um, any other of the uh, people who haven't had a chance to answer that that last question? No. Okay. Um, we have one more, um, and maybe um, Fatima, you can um, answer this one. If you could shed some light on how you dealt with more sensitive feedback from communities. Um, particularly if communities prefer to keep their feedback confidential. Um, yeah, we've, we've had a number of incidents where we've come across some really incredibly sensitive information. And normally with our action-based planning process, we filter all issues primarily um, with, with the donor at the front end, but primarily through the partner, implementing partner. When we do come across um, potentially damaging high-risk uh, feedback, we filter that directly through the donor and then set a working group um, in motion to that involves MESH as well and at some point the partner but farther along the line on how to deal with this. The MESH's role here is to really dig a bit farther and really verify um, the claims that are being made and, and build sort of a case or not uh, for pursuit. Um, at some point, uh, the onus is placed on the donor to really take uh, appropriate action um, as, as the last resort where um, issues, where it's felt that the implementing partners themselves are too, um, in, are too partial to be dealing with it. Over to you, Jess. Great, thanks, Fatima. Um, anyone else who's working on, you know, getting feedback from directly from communities and, and using it for their programming and, and how they deal with that kind of um, sensitive information? Leoba, do you have any thoughts? Oh, no, thank you. I think I should basically say it all. Thanks. Okay, there's one question then for, for you specifically um, around triangulation of data. Um, and the question is, which data did you triangulate and what were your additional data sources? Um, and how can organizations best cooperate on collecting and responding to feedback from uh, crisis affected people? And I think uh, that last one isn't necessarily about, about data, but if you can talk more about how you went about triangulating the data and what sources were used. Okay, uh, thank you, Jess. So from the findings that we got, uh, we got two interesting findings. The first one was that uh, youths 
were identified as one of the groups struggling to access information. And we also noted that in some parts of the districts that we conducted the survey, uh, most people said that their economic situation had increased. So uh, from the data that we got, we were now like, oh, so the youth are struggling to access information. How best can we ensure that this is true? So we went on further to, to the districts and then to the communities themselves and also engaged the youth themselves on, uh, on, on trying to find information on what information they were struggling to access, if this was true as, um, as the findings. So we got interesting findings that they were also struggling to access information. And as a, as a standpoint, we also managed to, to utilize uh, platforms that they can access, for instance, use of WhatsApp groups, as some of them could not access data for, for the Facebook and internet. And then uh, for the economic situations uh, that had increased in some districts, which uh, we thought that maybe uh, economic situation would have decreased since we were in the lockdown and the COVID borders were closed. But uh, we noted that it was true. Uh, say some people were using unauthorized borders to go and buy basic needs and then supply to the people. So this was really uh, the information that we triangulated with what we got supported by the key informant interviews that we did. So yeah, that is what uh, we did. And then also the other question, how to cooperate, collecting and responding. We have been utilizing ongoing activities. For instance, uh, we are doing an awareness campaign. We are responding to the data that we have, um, we have got. At the same time, we are utilizing that time to collect, um, to collect feedback, which we will use for the next awareness sessions that we'll be conducting. Thank you, Jess, over. Great, thanks so much, Leoba. Um, just finally, um, we have about five minutes left and we still have uh, so many people who are still um, logged on. So thank you all for, for staying with us. Um, I'm going to hand over now to Philippe Besson, who is the head of the multilateral division of the Swiss Development Cooper uh, Cooperation. Um, and he'll give some concluding summary remarks and then I will say goodbye and we will have a closing closing slide. So over to you, Philippe. Thanks, Jessica, and great to be uh, with, with you. Um, really, congratulations to, to, to the panel, of course, to, to you, Jessica, for the moderation. And uh, great to have so many people on uh, online. Um, I was thinking that um, what we've experienced now is the expression of the, the progress we have made in the past years. We, we see how accountability to, to affected people has now taken up, it, it, it has entered our mindsets. However, I also believe that this is um, to a certain extent um, a conversation um, amongst the ones that are convinced the 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 happy few if you like and we'll have to think uh, how we can spread this and in this respect of course uh, mark lowcox little bomb may may help us may give us some uh, mileage on on uh, how to to go on from there generally speaking um, and i think this conversation showed it we uh, as an ecosystem but also as an industry we still are stuck with a certain number of uh, attitudes and behaviors that are not very conducive. I, I would argue that still oftentimes we, we think we know that we are the most competent ones. Uh, we usually take very little time to, to reflect because we are busy saving lives. So what's, what's the need of analyzing or reviewing? then there is this bit of an attitude still, but the, that's where the testimonies of today are so encouraging still. The, this notion that we are talking to people who are passive victims and therefore how could they competently co comment on what they need and how they need it. And then, the, of course, I, I'm speaking as a person here mainly, but uh, uh, I'm part of a donor system, uh, the Swiss one in this case. There's this notion of who pays command. We have also seen the, uh, that uh, donors influence positively or sometimes quite negatively the equation. So ticking the box just because it will 
satisfy the donor. We, we obviously still have an issue there. And perhaps the one which I find most difficult to uh, address, but which may be the most important one, is, is that we drown in info, in data, but on the other hand, uh, oftentimes we are not aware of the political economy. And several of us have talked about the power relations. Uh, I think we, we need to, to also admit that we enter contexts in which uh, some uh, we will try locally to, to capture uh, resources to, to influence the way we, we proceed. There, there is also a lot of predatory uh, behavior in, in our ecosystem. And that's where we, we probably have to go further, be, be beyond the, the average focus group discussion. But again, uh, I, I think progress as uh, demonstrated by my colleagues today is really admirable and, and it gives me a lot of hope. What should we do from now on? I, I think, and this was said, there, there is a case to prove that um, engaging into accountability to affected people will uh, provide for more value for for more return on the, the humanitarian investment on official development assistance. I, I think obviously that in some cases we we the donors will have to learn listening at the partners much better and the partners will need from time to time to say no say that, that there are some conditions that are not acceptable um, we have collectively to make ourselves aware of all the issues and i think uh, the conversation today has showed that it it is not only happening but it is uh, really spreading all across the, uh, the the ecosystem. My last point would be that uh, yes, um, what Mark Lowcock has uh, written and what's also proposed by Ground Truth Solutions, uh, I think, needs to be explored. We need peer pressure. We we need genuine accountability uh, as to the way. Uh, we we speak versus the way we we actually be, behave, and so we we need facts, we need evidence, uh, and much more of that. And of course, the I think we we also have to to note the ethical um, element of this. We we need to look at whose voice counts and and how we we support people's dignity and their agency. Uh, and this is one of the most difficult things to do, as, especially in, in a situation of emergency. But that's where, uh, yes, we, we need external views. We, we, we need to, to have sort of a system. It could be an independent commission. I think uh, one of the pitfalls would be to create an additional bureaucracy but uh, nevertheless, it it's certainly is, uh, I take it for, for a fact that uh, we, we, we need somehow to, to take a leap and, and uh, establish something of, uh, of the kind. So many, many thanks for giving uh, me the chance to uh, share some of uh, my reflections. They are of course only tentative. And back to you, Jessica, thanks very much. Philip, thank you so much for those uh, closing summary remarks. Um, and I, I really agree with um, what you've said. We've had some really inspiring examples um, that we've heard today uh, from the ground, everything from you know, how organizations are using feedback um, for their own programming to how they're using it in, in monitoring and evaluation and also um, to influence some of the, the higher level coordination um, processes. Um, and I think you, know, you said we need to take, take a leap, um, which 
you know, many organizations have, as we've just heard today have already done and, and it's quite inspiring. So we're over time. Um, and I just want to thank the, the panelists so much for your excellent um, presentations, your insights, your, um, your answering the, these questions and our conversations. I wanna thank everyone in the audience also for engaging. There was a ton of chat, which I haven't had the opportunity to, to go through, but I saw the comments um, lighting up the whole time. So thank you for your engagement. Um, again, thank you to Ground Truth Solutions and to um, the IFRC um, for organizing this, this great event um, and for giving me the opportunity to, to be part of it. And um, I think we have, I don't know if there's one other slide with other, yes, um, other sessions on AAP, but I encourage you all to uh, stay tuned and look out for these as they will um, for sure be as engaging and great as this one. So have a great rest of your Thursday, everyone. And um, thank you again. Bye.